Hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Several years ago, the Wildlife Department made a huge investment in 7th through 12th grade students across the state by creating the Oklahoma Scholastic Shooting Sports Program. It's a trap-based shooting program that's more popular today than ever before. Teachers are trained by us on how to instruct their students and are then even eligible to receive a starter kit of equipment. Schools and groups like FFA are divided into regions and we even hold regional and state competitions like this one here today. A wildlife department that recognizes today's youth are tomorrow's sportsmen. Just another reason to love Oklahoma and the adventures that await you. I have a passion for photography that's very similar to my passion for hunting and I, I, see, uh, I see both of these hobbies as being something that I struggle with which one I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So I live in uh, southwest Oklahoma, uh, right in the backyard of the Wichita Mountains. The refuge is, is so close and it's full of all sorts of, of just wonderful animals, um, vegetation, you name it. There's a lot of cool things to see out there. Just right at 10 years ago now, uh, my wife and I bought a camera just for general use and reasons and I started carrying that camera around with me in the field. Very quickly, that turned into from, uh, from just a, a, a little small interest to a hobby to something that I'm very passionate about now. There's ties between photography and hunting that are so similar to each other, and so there's that hunt for the picture, um, there's patterning the animals that you're looking for, being used to how they would act, or their, their temperaments, um, or how they, they may act whenever you're around them. And so photography, while you're chasing that shot, if you will, um, it's just the same as hunting in so many different aspects. It's just you don't uh, necessarily take home meat for the freezer, you take home uh, pictures and memories that you've, you've made while you're in the field. Did that deer lay down right here? No, he didn't. The Wichita Mountains, they manage their deer herd very well. Um, it's been managed for years and years and as a result of that management you see an older age class of bucks that are coming through. Um, so you see your five and a half, six and a half, your seven year old deer um, that are that are just growing astronomical antlers and so you see those huge bucks that all of us, you know, as a, as a hunter even myself, um, I just dream to see them. You know, those, those deer are showstoppers for me, you know, so if I have the opportunity to get pictures of a trophy deer um, it's a trophy to me just in the picture itself. So we pulled up and there were uh, three bucks that were cruising across the road here and so we got a few few good pictures of one of the bucks. The bigger of the three bucks was uh, on a mission. He was looking for a girlfriend and so he's, he's made his way off but the other two are still kind of here close. Every day that I go out to take pictures right now during the rut is me not also saying no to going hunting and it is a a deep inside personal struggle because right now just like any deer hunter when the rut is going on um, the attention of those big bucks has been swayed and their attention is, attention is on the ladies that are around them and so the opportunity to get pictures of these deer is so much better it's almost like a sunday drive um, through the woods and you're always got an eye out for a deer or critters or um, just whatever may pop out uh, and then when you see them you kind of slow up and you try to adjust yourself to where you can take a picture um, whether that is in the vehicle or getting out and working towards. Really, it's just a matter of recognizing, seeing the deer, 
um, getting yourself safely stopped um, and then getting that camera up into the window to be able to take a picture and you know that's something that you'd like to see happen in three to five seconds it doesn't always happen that way but but ideally that's the way it happens so it's not all um, just about big game and big flashy animals so there's all sorts of things out there uh, that are beautiful in their own way and some of the things are smaller um, you know like butterflies for example um, you know this butterfly is only about an inch and a half tall but when taking a picture of and able to see it, man, there's all sorts of beauty on this. Um, our native wildflowers, the same thing. Um, there's all sorts of wonderful things out there that you can take pictures of, uh, things that make great pictures, and it's all very literally out there in our own backyards. Um, even some of our upland game birds. Um, I love if the, if the opportunity presents itself when I'm in the field, um, I'm, I'm never out there just looking for a picture of one certain thing. Uh, even even a drab female uh, red-winged blackbird can make for a wonderful picture. For me, I'm constantly chasing the right composition, the right lighting. Um, you know, I, I, don't, uh, I don't just hit the shutter anymore just to have the picture um, anymore. If I'm hitting the shutter, it's, it, it's a picture that I think is gonna be suitable for keeping um, uh, framing or showing. Um, and so for me, it's just, uh, it's taking an ordinary subject, which could be a white-tailed deer, a small white-tailed deer, and presenting it in an extraordinary way. And so something that somebody may look at any other day and say, hmm, you know, that's just normal, but in the pictures that I'm taking, I try to present them in a way that somebody would say, wow, you know, that, that looks amazing, for whatever reason that it may be. There he is. Right straight across. Dang it. Yeah. Yeah. Bad shot. I mean, not bad shot, but well, he's a good one. Oh, I've got pictures of that deer. Right. Meh. Meh. Look at me. Meh. 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 Really, when it came down to it, uh, when I picked up that camera and started to enjoy it, uh, I just had this desire to learn. I, I enjoyed doing it and I liked it and I wanted to be better at it. And so it was a constant, for me, it was a constant learning game of I would go out and take pictures and then I would go home and I would say, well, this looks good about this picture or this doesn't look good or this is pleasing about this picture. Uh, read several books, um, did a lot of research online. Um, but in the end, uh, for me, hands-on experience proved to be extremely beneficial. Yeah, good pictures. Yep, there's another one, another nanny. Dang it, that should have been the big buck. That would have been the perfect picture. I mean, not that two does together isn't. I enjoy taking pictures of big game. I also enjoy chasing birds, um, shorebirds and wading birds. Um, I, love, I love being able to take a picture and, and share it with somebody, whether it's on social media or it's family or it's friends, and, and show them what exactly lies in our own backyards. And, and more often than not, people see these pictures and they're going, you know, goodness, where was this? Where was, you know, where were you at? What were you doing? You know, where was it taken? And here locally, the Lawton area, for a lot of these people, they're 10 minutes from where they can see this, or they're 15 minutes from where they can see this. And so um, just providing people the knowledge and the information that it's in your own backyard, for me, that, that proves is a really big thing for me. So just because I'm out there with a big lens and I've got a, a, a camera to match it, it doesn't mean you can't go out there and experience it. It doesn't mean you can't take your phone, um, any camera that you have, or even your binoculars, um, or even just going out there to see it. Um, I'd say to anybody who's thinking about getting out there and doing it, get out there and go do it. It's enjoyable. Um, every experience is new.
that's an awesome picture. Oh, I'm gonna pull forward. Too much show going on there. He's gonna pee, that's awesome, he's making a scrape. Every picture tells a story, and while there may be thousands of pictures that I've taken over the years, every single one of them I can look at, and there's something behind the lens that was going on that I can recall. You know, the, the hunting aspect, I hope I can pass on to my children. Um, the photography aspect, you know, if they show interest, then I'll be all there. Um, I, I love spending time with others that have the interest, people that ask the questions, and so for me, yes, um, while I may be chasing the same white-tailed deer in 20 years, it's gonna be a new picture. One of the questions we often get during deer season is whenever I shoot a deer and it runs onto my neighbor's property, can I go over and retrieve that deer? No, you cannot. You must have landowner's permission to enter that property. Hello. Sure. Hello. Hey, I'm Jerry Starkey. Hello, I'm Kelly. I got a uh, deer lease down there on Dr. Meyer's land. It's yeah. south south of your uh, property down there. Yeah. And I shot a deer, and it took off, went a few hundred yards, and I think it jumped the fence, went over on your land. And I just wonder if I could get permission. All right, so, is it back over there along the creek? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, let's get in my truck, and we'll drive over there and look at it, and and see if it is actually on my property or not. All right, sounds good. I was hunting right over on this side over here, and uh, my tree stands back off over in that way over there. Go over here, I'll show you where he crossed the road at. Now my tree stand, this, like I say, it's back over there, and uh, there's some hair on the fence right here, and you can see the blood there and there. We can go on, but there's some deer hair. Okay. So we probably you know, went up there. There's blood right there. There's the blood. There it is right there. <laughs> Good job. All right, man. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. If for some reason you've not been able to get in touch with your neighbor, what should you do? Thank you.
Best thing to do is contact your area game warden and let them know what's going on. Many times the game warden knows the neighbor and will make contact with them and we can go and retrieve the deer that way. State Game Warden, this is Travis. Hey, this is Jerry Starkey. Hey, uh, I've got a deer lease on Dr. Myers' land. I shot a doe a while ago, and it, and it jumped over to the adjacent uh, landowner's property, and I can't find anybody uh, home. And I was wondering if uh, you might be able to advise me or assist me. So you've got a good blood trail going to the fence? Yeah, I got a good blood trail, and you can see, you know, right where I shot it, and it went a few hundred yards and hopped the fence. Okay. And uh, you say you're at the... Uh... I'm at the, what I think to be the landowner's house right now, and like I say, nobody's home. Okay, I'm on my way. Nice to meet you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it took me some doing, but I was able to get permission from the landowner, and uh, so he said that it's okay if, if I accompany you and we go out and, and recover your deer. Good deal. Yeah, I can show you right where I shot it at. All right, sounds good. If you want to jump in your vehicle, I'll follow you out there. All right, thanks. My tree stands a couple hundred yards down that way. Okay. Uh, you can go right here, I'll show you. There's blood here and blood there. I don't know if you can see that blood right here, but anyway, however far you want to go down and kind of backtrack if you want. Okay, okay, so we've got blood here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, Let's you know, go ahead and just take it up to the fence. Show me where it crossed the fence at. Okay. Yeah, it went across. There's the blood and there's the blood right there. It's got to be in there somewhere in that woods or down over there. And there's some hair and you can see the blood right over there too. You got it. All right. Let's All right. go get it. Cool. There it is right there. There he is. Yep. Hey. Yep. Congratulations. Thank you. Now I better get my tag on her. Deal here. Well, I sure appreciate it. Hey, glad that land I could help. Yeah, glad he gave us permission to do this. Good thing to do is before the season to get out and to know and to meet your near neighbors so that you can have a good relationship with them and have it worked out before season that if you do need to go over, that you can go over and retrieve the deer or simply to call them and let them know that you're going to be there. Spotting another hunter wearing all camouflage in the field is very difficult, and during hunting season it can be downright dangerous. That's why it is important to follow the laws regarding the use of hunter orange. Can you see the hunter? How about now? Whoa, let's take another look at that. Wearing hunter orange sure does make a difference, doesn't it? One reason we wear hunter orange is so that other hunters can identify us as another hunter. The safest color to wear while hunting is solid hunter orange. But not all hunter orange or hunter orange garments are created equal or are the best or correct usage. Showing each example at the same time, let's see how each looks as they get deeper and more concealed into the woods. Clearly, a full hunter orange top and hat is the most visible and thus the safest. Fred and Al have some of the finest beagle hounds in Oklahoma. Several of these dogs were winners in state field trials, and all of them are excellent hunters, well trained and eager. The beagle hound is a relatively old breed of dogs originating in England more than 400 years ago where they were bred for small game hunting, especially rabbit hunting.
Today, the Beagle Hound is one of the most popular hunting dogs in America. And at one time, because of his small size and his kind and tractable disposition, threatened to rival the Cocker Spaniel as a family pet and playmate for children. With their dogs off in search of Peter Cottontail, Fred and Al illustrate a good point in the handling of firearms, loading their guns in the field rather than in the car or at home. Like the bobwhite quail, the cottontail cares neither for the gloom of the forest nor the glare of the plains, but is most likely to be found among the brushy borderlands. Second to none as a rabbit hunter, the beagle has a good nose for picking up a trail and a lot of natural savvy at working brush piles and other places where a cottontail may be hiding. Sometimes the dogs scatter all over the countryside, but at other times the whole pack may converge on a likely looking brush pile. And Mr. Rabbit? Well, he's no slouch at evading a pack of dogs. The cottontail doesn't have the endurance of the hounds, but must depend upon speed, camouflage, and backtracking to escape the persistent little beagles. Sooner or later, though, the baying dogs will drive the rabbit past the hunters, and when they do, bang, the hunters have bagged a rabbit. And it's the end of the trail for old Mr. Cottontail. Hunters are always proud of the game they bag, and it's an unusual hunter that doesn't want to show the first rabbit of the hunt to his buddy. The dogs are interested in this sort of thing, too. And seemingly, they are just as proud as if they had fired the shot themselves. Hunting rabbits with beagle hounds is a sport. And whether the men get one rabbit or a dozen, they've had a lot of fun and are just as pleased as if their hunting coats were bulging with game. So one of our hunters, Fred Sulzbach, gives a few blasts on his horn to call in the dogs and bring an end to a short but successful hunt. And the dogs, of course, are quick to respond. Sometimes, however, the beagles are not ready to give up the hunt. So to make sure that the dogs don't go bounding away after another rabbit, the little hounds are led back to the cars on leashes. So that's the way it is with beagle hounds. Just turn them loose almost anywhere in Oklahoma, and you're sure to get some game, as well as a lot of fun and sport out of rabbit hunting. Well, we hope today's stories remind you that Oklahoma is such a perfect state to explore. So, however you choose to enjoy our state's incredible natural world, remember that your adventure starts with Outdoor Oklahoma. Good? Yeah. Outdoor Oklahoma is produced by the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and is proud to serve and be funded entirely by sportsmen and women and outdoor enthusiasts who love and appreciate all things wild in the great state of Oklahoma. Someday you ought to just come out and just give me a hug. <laughs> um, we all hug Todd.